Hello, my name is Carol May Wittick, spiritual life coach and your host of Her Conversations, Tools for the Awakening. Her is an acronym for Higher Energetic Resonance. This is the optimal state to embody in order to attract our highest desires. What is the awakening? This is the moment in time when humanity rises up out of the darkness. Who is awakening? Each one of us present on earth today, reclaiming our sovereignty, seeking greater possibilities in our reality and looking for solutions. We know being awakened is not a lofty ideal but a necessity. If we can transform ourselves, we can change the world. Guests on Her Conversations will speak to your spirituality, sensuality and soul. Listen to their stories and hear how they are in service to the world. Let their words and these conversations embolden and inspire you. Before this episode with Suzanne Gerber, I'd like to share with you some ways that I can support you. Firstly, if you tune into Her Inspirations, the sister podcast to this title, each episode I'll explore with you a different aspect of our spiritual and creative journeys. Also, if you join the mailing list, you'll receive emails with additional teaching points and resources for you to explore on your own personal journey. Or if you're somebody that has always wanted to be heard in the world and whether that means you're launching your own podcast, you're showing up more social media content online or you're doing public speaking or maybe you just want to be more heard in your life, I've created your Awakened Voice for you. This is my course that uses a holistic approach acknowledging the intricate connection between your physical body, mind and spirit. This course empowers you to discover and develop your voice. Or maybe you're ready for a more personalised experience and you want to work with me one-to-one. If you know there's a purpose for your life, my purpose is to support you. In particular, I'm working with women over 40. I'm helping you to trust your intuition, rediscover your innate creativity and use your decades of wisdom to design your purposeful life. All the links to these offers are in the show notes below. My guest this week is Suzanne Gerber, a seasoned astrological counsellor. She has a deep training in shamanic energy and plant medicine, Jungian and Buddhist psychology, dream work and quantum physics. Through her website starsandstoneshealing.com, she offers insights for self-discovery and empowerment. During our conversation, Suzanne shares her unique perspective on how astrology guides us to navigate life's journey and also talks about the impact of the shift of Pluto into Aquarius and what that will create for the future of the collective. So as always, I begin by asking my guests, HER is an acronym for Higher Energetic Resonance. When do you feel that Higher Energetic Resonance? What a great question. I try to feel it as much as I can. I find that when I'm working with clients on an astrological reading, usually not together, usually by Zoom, it's still there's something about when our energies come together that it just elevates me and it opens up channels so that even after I've spent an hour analyzing somebody's chart, I have no idea who the person is going to be with first-time clients. Mm -hmm. And when our energies connect, I feel like there's an uplifting that happens with both of us because we're together in a very high vibrational intention. Mm. Mm, I love that response. And isn't it bizarre as well, just kind of referencing Zoom, how even though there is this space between us, you know, that we we are able to connect and connect in it on a deeper way that doesn't really make sense over the technology through the technology I, I'm always like quite fascinated by that as well because I've had connections with people where it's been really quite deep really and it you know you think we're going through this technology and how people think technology is good or bad or indifferent what it's creating for us and, and how it's allowing us to mesh ourselves really through this medium so it's, it's great that it's helped us how and it's helped your work clearly it overcomes boundaries when you think about it just not that long ago right we a video call was exotic right i mean a lot of us were early adopters of skype or things like that Mm. um but it it was something that you couldn't really just do it on a regular basis and we became very acclimated to being in person with somebody or, or maybe talking on the phone but that always I feel like that always felt like a remove because you couldn't make eye contact mm. there's something about when our eyes connect mm-hmm. I think we take things to another level 
you know, not everybody's comfortable with modern technology. And this isn't even a reflection of their age. It's just their nature. And there are some people that just aren't real. They don't feel like they can be personal and confidential and intimate on a medium like this, the way we're talking right now. But some of us are so adaptable and so attuned to it, and there's no judgment here. But I find I don't feel any difference between talking to you this way and if you were sitting right by my side or across from me at a cafe at a little table outdoors. It's it's our intention, and it's allowing our energy to just rise up and stay open and I think this is such a great lead in, Caroline, because I know one of the things we want to talk about astrologically is this shift of the zeitgeist of the planet Pluto. And some people will say, wait, isn't that a dwarf planet? Sure. Let's not split hairs. Pluto is intense <laughs> energetically. So call him whenever you want. His, his impact is undeniable. So Pluto moving into Aquarius, which is the sign that among all the things it represents is the avant-garde, is technology, is modern communication. And so as Pluto, just last year it started, this year in more in earnest, next year full on, it really is kind of a resistance is futile. This is, this isn't the future, this is now. The future has arrived and technology is neutral. We use it in certain ways with certain intentions. And when we have that clear intention to connect, to help, to improve, to serve, how could, how could that ever be a negative? Of course, there'll always be people who find ways to use it for identity theft and, and false you know, information and things like that. But it's the technology itself is neutral. It's how we work with it that, that can shift. But what it is, it's an opening into another dimension of connectivity. And that's what I find the most exciting. Beautiful. Before we go deeper into that, I realise I, I, there's a question I just want to give you an, an opportunity to just say how you got to working in the field that you're working in today. I think I stopped resisting it. <laughs> I think <laughs> there's a lot of indications in my chart, and I see it in a lot of other people's, that working with astrology, and for other people it, it might be some other divination or healing uh, modality, but I've been obsessed with the planets and the stars my whole life. My first dream was that the planets were hanging from strings from the sky. I dreamed about the moon. I dreamed about things coming, landing from, I won't say outer space, but space and landing at my feet. I was obsessed with the planets in, in grade school. Um, that was my first science project was very artistically and painstakingly recreating the whole solar system. Throughout high school, I would talk to anybody who would listen about their sun signs because that's kind of all I knew. And even after college, when I went away and lived in Europe um, with my, my then partner, and he was going to be coming back to the States to pursue an academic path and career. All I wanted to do was find an astrology teacher. So I don't think I found it so much as I just allowed it to come through me. And I started studying, I mean, so, so long ago in the 1980s, and I've never stopped, but I didn't feel like before the internet, another Aquarian medium, before the internet, it would you'd have to be very devoted and it would be a real hustle to try to make a living doing it. And that wasn't the way I wanted to live. So I had a, you know, a quote unquote real job <laughs> in, in journalism, which was my other great passion. But I've been doing astrology for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And um, I think well, I touched or mentioned this to you before we kind of switched on and just saying how, um, the art, I want to call it, of astrology is being so much more uh, welcomed on a, on a deeper mainstream way as well. I mean, my I've always been fascinated with it, 
but I was just, you know, the, my initial exposure to, to astrology was just reading it in the back of a magazine or in the back of the newspaper, you know, and, and the, there'd always be kind of like one of the bigger um, or more famous astrologers that we had here was a woman called Mystic Meg, who would be in the Sunday papers and there was this little image of her with, you know, the bangs and the fringes, you know, a real kind of like a stereotypical mystical woman with her hands over um, a crystal ball and everything else. And, and realising actually that those, the, that breakdown, you know, that three line breakdown every week was, was so generic that until I started to discover how it could go so much deeper and look into and understanding people on so many different levels, because it seemed like, how could that possibly be? You know, like it, from from a, a logical mind thinking brain, it's like that doesn't make sense. But then do we live in a logical world anyway? So the, the fact that there are so many um, different ways of really uh, pointing out and understanding who we are individually and the fact that there are so many individuals and each individual has their own path, I find so ultimately um fascinating but then the skill of being able to read a chart um i have friends who speak astrology to me and i try my best you know and i just remember the basics of my own uh, but i i highly respect them because i know that when it comes to something like music i can read music and they can't so we all have our you know our, our little skills and that's theirs but um yeah like i that's what i think is so beautiful about it is the fact that it can just pitch a, a, a path for an individual and that's what's so magical about it I find um is that what brought you in deeper to it I've always been into it deeply mm. I would say I told you I had a career in journalism working mostly in magazines and then as that started to morph into the digital realm I would work on websites but then even that started to shift right everything became more about clicks <laughs> and likes and, and the game changed. There's still serious journalism. But a lot of us kind of felt squeezed out of it. And I also moved states. I left. I, I live in the U.S. and I left New York. And I moved to Florida to help take care of my mom. Mm -hmm. and, my, and journalism wasn't really such a viable option for me. And I decided, why not just make a go of this full time? And that that was maybe about almost 10 years ago. And that's when... The more you work with people, the more you listen to people, the more you sit, we're not technically sitting in circle, but in a sacred way we are. And when you have the opportunity to really get into somebody's life when they invite you into their confidences, it's really impossible not to go deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. And I've never stopped studying. I mean, I first sat down with my teacher in 1983 and I learned something I would have to say on a weekly basis. So there's learning about astrological techniques and meanings and the more newly discovered planets and planetoids out there in our solar system and particularly beyond it, just beyond Pluto. Uh, it's higher dimensional things out there. But we also, as astrologers, we continue our studies in human nature and in depth psychology and in different spiritual disciplines. So the more work I did, say, in the shamanic realm, um, I started to see things differently, and I started to make connections between these, these understandings about the different dimensions of consciousness mm -hmm. and what is the meaning of the human struggle and what, what is the soul and all those great metaphysical questions. And the better able an astrologer is to have a cosmology that makes sense, that they can convey to the client. That's as helpful as pointing out very highly technical things, which is great, but if you can't apply it to the person sitting in front of you, you're just putting on a show. Mm. It's so important to have these things make sense. And we're all operating at different levels. We're all we're all souls having a human existence on an evolutionary journey. And everybody's at a different place. Mm -hmm. And it's not better. They're, they're not, you know, more evolved. I mean, maybe you could say it that way, but we are where we are. And we're all 
trying to get to the same place. Our job is just to sit with them and to help them find clues in the code of their charts. Mm. And sort of to what you were asking before about um, it becoming more popular back in the day when we would read those those columns. And, and I will admit, back in the day, I wrote many of those columns. Mm. Um, and it's we acknowledge it's for entertainment purposes only. My guiding principle was say something positive, even when it's a heavy day in the sky. I think once COVID hit and we were all thrown into this place of confusion and unknowing and fear and paranoia and division, instead of coming together, I think many people were driven more apart by politicizing certain um, ideas about the disease and vaccines. And we certainly don't need to talk about that, but the net result was people went deeper and deeper into their own worlds, into their own psyches. And I think they were really seeking meaning because suddenly the world seemed very absurd and random and even potentially dark and dangerous. They wanted meaning. They wanted to know that there are patterns, there are cycles, there are things that make sense. And bottom line, that there's a reason they're here and that their life has a purpose. And it isn't just a sign to them, you know, like in school where they say, this will be your teacher, go to that classroom. It isn't that. We engage with our lives. We engage with, it's not quite a destiny, but it is like a blueprint. But we get to make choices along the way. Yes to this one, no thank you to that one knowing there are always karmic consequences to our choices, but we are still engaged with it. And I think it's this collective quest for meaning and significance and understanding when we really learn astrology, not only do we learn really cool techniques and we can see timing of events and we can understand why two people get along or why two people just, you know, like oil and vinegar, Um, We really can see all that, but bottom line, to me, the greatest gift of astrology is understanding that there's an intelligence to life. There's a loving, benign force in the universe, and that everything, even the planets that people are, you know, kind of wary of, like Pluto and Saturn, and what are they going to do to me? We really come away with this understanding that they aren't doing anything to you. They're reflecting things from that are happening from within you. Also from, you know, extrinsically from the zeitgeist, from the collective. When very powerful people and, and institutions and governments take action, there are ripple effects throughout the world. So we're not always in control of that. We can't control what happens in North Korea, say. But there are consequences for us all. But people wanted to know that they had agency. Mm -hmm. And they felt so lost that they really wanted to be redirected to their special gifts and their purpose. And that is what's the most exciting thing about this renaissance or revival of astrology in the, in the 21st century and into, into the 2020s. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned a word and you may or may not have meant it in this context, but it's just one of the words that gets, used a lot you talked about dimensions and there's a lot of talk about you know moving into other dimensions different people talk about it in different ways um but there is i feel definitely a shift of wanting to have like a different way of life wanting to have uh, a different structure and a different experience in terms of what life means or what life can mean or why we're here and seeing the buck against the kind of prescribed life that people have you know that you you kind of you you get to this age you go to college you come here you buy a house you do this you do this and if you don't you're you know it's not going to work for you but it seems like the vast majority of people who do that never really have find that um that solace within themselves and think that they've lived a, a life you know, there's always going to be something of could there be more and they could have had outwardly success. They could have had the children and the loving family, but then still feel that there was just like a piece missing. And 
what is it is it written for some people to take the path of going like I feel that this I can't even play that game and then others to go well this is the way it is I'm I'm going to take it that I'm I'm going to do what it is because I can't see anything else what is it about um trying to find that newer dimension of existence that that draws some people away from the prescribed life and others just will continue with it even though their soul might be pulling them in another way or there might be that constant whisper of look for something more is that something that's written in in a chart to say that you will you know you might feel this you'll you'll follow through and you will just buck against the crowd no i know exactly what you're asking um first of all i think everybody has a seed for spiritual awakening how could we not we're all, whether you think of us as God's children or just a spark of the divine, it doesn't matter what language we use. I think we're all talking about the same, the same thing, more than ego. It's something beyond and it's something that connects us all. We all have the seed. Now, what happens to that seed? If you've ever planted a little garden, you know, some of your seeds are going to sprout, right? And some of them are going to turn into these gorgeous plants and maybe they produce food or flowers and it's just beautiful and enriching. And that's some people. And other people, they know the seed is there, but they don't know what to do with it. How do I nurture my spiritual nature? Mm-hmm. For some people, it's it just hasn't occurred to them. Like you said, people get busy. And there are all these little built-in rewards along the way to keep us on the straight and narrow. Just like our phones, all those little dings, those activate our reward centers. And when we kind of go along with what we think we're supposed to do, like you said, get the job, buy the house, marry the person, have the, you know, 2.1 children and the labradoodle. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I would love to have a dog. This is great. But for some people, that's just not going to fill what they're longing for. That longing is unique in all of us. Everybody has a longing for something. Some people will act on it and some people won't. And I think... It's their willingness and their courage to take the action for their dream that sets different people apart. I don't think by nature we're different. I think everybody has the potential for it. And it's true. Some people have easier lives. There's more privilege. There's more opportunity. And for some people, it's not just a lack of opportunity or privilege. It's the things happened in their childhood that kind of thwarted, that kind of suppressed the seed from growing. We're talking about the the very pervasive and very horrific kinds of abuse or just neglect or, or just being raised by narcissists or people, parents who, and so many people will acknowledge, my parents did the best they could, but they themselves had experienced that in their childhood. And that whole ancestral wounding that we're starting, you know, I would say for the last at least five years, if not 10 years, there's been this awareness of, wow, this isn't just me and this isn't just my family. This is my whole upline. And this is so many people I know or so many people I work with and get to serve. We're becoming aware of this. And in doing that, we realize We have a vision. We want to wake up spiritually. And it's not for the lack of desire. It's these things block us. Beautiful woman I was talking to yesterday who herself is a great astrologer, very highly sensitive person, came from a family of adoption where her adopted family really ignored her and competed with her and just not not a happy environment. But she she wanted to know how to find her sole purpose. And after working with the chart and going deeper and deeper together, she, she just kept saying, I don't know what it is. And when I said, well, if I put a gun to your head and said, teach me something right now, what would be your passion? She said, well, this. I said, this astrology? She said, yes. I said, let's look for it in the chart. See, sometimes we look at a chart and we try to make sense of what presents itself. And there's many ways to interpret it. And sometimes somebody will share something. I'm looking for my sole purpose. Is it astrology? So then we go looking for that specifically. It was all over her chart. Mm. And I said, the astrology is here. What's holding you back? And she said, 
I don't want to blame anybody, but all those years of parental early childhood conditioning, I still don't think I'm good enough. I still don't think I deserve this. So it wasn't the lack of vision. It was just such a pervasive shutting down of this beautiful, excited, curious, talented child that even at age, whatever she was in her 50s, she didn't have this confidence that she could or should do that. Mm -hmm. And so we not only look for the seeds of a spiritual awakening, we want to understand what might be getting in the way and help that person find a way not to deny it, but to process it, to work with it, and and to really integrate it into their bigger self so that they, it can come up and they could, like, maybe a noisy pet, and they could have it quiet down, go in the corner, play with that little toy so that they can get on with their life's work. I will say one more thing. There are cycles that happen of the moving planets in the sky and the way, the angles that they make to the planet's in your birth chart, which is to say at the exact moment when you were born. And so as the moving planets form different angles, it will activate or potentiate some of these native dormant potentials. Or even if you've been doing it, it will like turbocharge them. And suddenly there's an urgency. I need to do this. I need to quit my corporate job. I need to take courses to become. I've been, you know, people will say to me, I've always heard, I've always been able to communicate with beings who've gone past in, in the other realms, mm. but they're, they've been afraid or they, they didn't think they were good or they didn't, whatever. And now they're starting to realize they're taking classes. Also, how beautiful, coincidentally, except there's no such thing as coincidence, Here's the internet with all these people who have these gifts and these skills and are teaching. You don't have to have such a master in your hometown or in the big city 45 minutes away. It's it, Everybody can study with anybody and learn and train and develop these gifts within themselves. Typically around age 29, when the planet Saturn makes its full orbit and returns, we have a major life shift mm -hmm. from about... 40 to 45, we'll all go through four major plan outer planet connections to themselves in the chart, which will make us look at our lives differently. Now, some people will look at our life different, their life differently and go, yeah, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's free will. Other people will go, I don't know how I'm going to pull it off, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to leave this toxic relationship. I'm going to move to my dream location. I'm going to give it a go, and try to do this kind of work that I feel like will contribute more to society than programming, you know, for a major tech company. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. It's just if that's not feeding their soul, they are they're in denial about their, their greatest self. And then again, at age 50 is another huge one when the planet or planetoid or asteroid or centaur Chiron, which I know you were just having a beautiful conversation about, makes his return, and that can be our greatest awakening. When we not only see what we're meant to do in the world, but we're meant to understand ourselves in a new way, so that all those things that we thought we didn't like about ourselves and thought were our shortcomings or our weaknesses or made us weird or, you know, like not we didn't fit in, are actually our greatest gifts, and we come to own them and integrate them, and we life literally changes when we change how we hold our vision of ourselves. Mm -hmm. I can attest to that for sure. <laughs> when, <laughs> like when I had that, um, yeah, because I turned like it was. Um, I can't remember now. Two years ago, well, October. Um, uh, yeah, about two years ago. And it yeah, was a I'll... long period for you because it kept going over it and returning and retrograding and returning. Yeah, yeah. There was a, you know, I'm, I was trying to think of like the 40 to 40. I don't know. I can't, I can't remember that. It's interesting now that I'm in my 50s looking at my 40s and and seeing how much of a, that was an interesting decade. I didn't realize how much of a of a tunnel that was. You know, it was a real. If I was, to, if I can now, I can look back on it and look back on it in clarity. I can say that was 
the first decade that I I wasn't necessarily completely on track with myself. You know, as I, I I was kind of dealing with many other things, but many I would think the majority of people, if they met me during their during my forties, probably don't really know who I am and what what I'm about. My at the core, you know, maybe like towards the end, or if people knew me from the um, from the podcast. But in terms of me, like being in my full expression, it really didn't happen in my forties because I kind of pulled back from. Um, doing music and everything like that for for like kind of 10 years you know <laughs> and and then coming back into it like you said with the fifth um turning 50 and it's like man I've I've done 50 years you know isn't that well for a start and then it's like okay so what am I going to do with these next years and like can I can I in my mind think that I can get another 50 out of the tank you know because that's the way that <laughs> I'm thinking about things and like going like if I if I think that I can get 50 more years out of this life, what am I going to do with it and how can I make it intentional and how can I make all of those years prior and all of those challenges because it was never an easy path really um, actually make sense now and with looking at everything for myself anyway looking um, at my life up until this point and actually starting to write it down um so that one it's going to be a book and everything is to see the sense that it that it actually makes you know and it's like yeah it will make sense I mean I wouldn't go I wouldn't go through it again for anyone you know, those people go all oh, to be 20 again I'm like I don't want to be 20 again I don't need that, that. I don't need that no thank you <laughs> no thank you at all you know like nothing to, to do with that so um grateful for all of those things but yeah have definitely felt that shift of of turning 50 and and having that real gear change um and just be and and then having technology you know at at my fingertips to really amplify and accelerate the work that I I do it just seems like everything kind of happened on time um you know everything always happens on time mm. when we don't when we don't see it that way, we're out of alignment. Mm. We have these expectations. This is, this is, ego is not a bad thing, but sometimes we confuse it for the divine timing. And there really is something, this blueprint that's unfolding. And again, we get to choose how to unfold it, but there, there are timings. And this to me is one of the terrific, I mean, and unrivaled gifts of astrology there's no other divination method where you can see timing is clearly, especially if you know your exact birth time. Mm. And you don't have to know exactly to do certain kinds of timing, but when you know your timing, you and anybody who tells you this will happen on this day, don't listen to them. We're not really fortune tellers. We look at energies. We look at openings. We look at waves and flows and unfoldings and that's what we're working with people and how do they want it to unfold they get to choose it but i love the way you were talking because um you were talking about perspective and when we're young we have this sense of urgency and immediacy and it can be very hard especially with really little kids we see it all the time how impatient they are and they want everything right away. And I mean, a lot of, you know, Aries are the same way and there can be adults. But um, as we get older, we realize, oh, that's going to happen. Or I now see why that thing that was such a major dramatic crisis in my 30s really was part of a bigger storyline, but I didn't have that perspective it's like when you go to an art museum and there's a giant canvas and you try to get really close. You can't see the art. You can see some details of it, right? You see some brush strokes. Maybe you see little blobs of paint. But you've got to stand back. And the bigger the piece and the more complex the piece, which is like our lives, they're big and complex, we've got to pull that camera pretty far back to really take it in and understand what's going on. And I love the way you connected the transits of the mid 40s, their early 40s to the mid 40s. And then Chiron comes next. And every one of these cycles does add to what we've just experienced. Mm 
Some of the planets are going to come around several times in our lifetime. Mm. The ones that come around every year, like Mercury, Venus, Mars is every other year, meaningful in personal ways at the time, but these are ephemeral. It's the it's really starting at about Jupiter out to Pluto with a few other things in there, like the nodes of the moon, which aren't planets or places. They're mathematically derived points that are only signal karma. It's a fascinating thing to work within the chart. And they take almost 19 years to do a cycle. So every time, say, Jupiter comes back around every 12 years, the nodes every almost 19, Saturn every 29, people say, am I... Is this just coming back to the same place? No. If we're paying attention the way you just described, if we're doing our own inner work when we realize things, it comes to the same point, but it's a spiral. If you can imagine this, you're coming around the same point, the same circumference, but at a higher level. And this is the beauty of both astrology and and getting older. People freak out when they turn 30, right? But that's the Saturn return. That's the beginning of their adult life. They freak out at 40, right? Oh, my God, now I'm old. Well, that's the beginning of the Pluto square and the Neptune square where their whole life suddenly meaning is the one thing that they hadn't really gotten. They've done the things. They got the job. They met the person. But what was the meaning of their individual life? And then Chiron at 50, everybody freaks out at 50. But 50 is really the gateway to the wisdom years. There's nothing like it. Mm. So part of what I love about astrology is that by by nature, it invites more appreciation, more acceptance, and more gratitude. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Definitely, I I can I can attest to all of those, and and with this and, and going back to the to to humanity in itself and where we're moving to, um, as as we move into this new age, are uh, is everyone going to shift into and embrace things the experience or the possibility of the experience that 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 is there? You know, like different teachers will talk about the kind of the split some people being here some people being in a different um in a different space in a different dimension in a different world you know um is that is that written within the charts as to who will benefit the most or who will have a, a, a greater appreciation of us being in that new space or is it um how how will that play out? Is it is it forever? Will everyone move, or will it be some will experience a different uh, awareness of what's happening? I I you know where I am at now. I I see that few people are realizing that there is a change, and and whether it's because they they know about astrology or they're just aware on a spiritual level that things are shifting, um, and others are maybe even doubling down into a world that seems to be disintegrating. Or maybe it's just disintegrating because the ones who are moving into a different space are paying less attention to it. So I don't know what you have to speak about with regards to that. This isn't astrology per se, but Mm. in statistics and in a lot of other, mostly statistics, there is a model that we use. And it's called the bell-shaped curve. Mm -hmm. And it's a statistical model of probability. Mm -hmm. And... It's basically, if you can picture a chart like a graph, it starts off really low, and then there's this big (laughs) upsurge, like a a narrow column, and then it comes back down. Mm -hmm. And the thinking here is about 80% of any population, and you can apply this to literally anything, um, how much people earn, people's height, whatever it is, it's statistical probability. 80% are going to be right in the middle right? Why uh, so many people have the same size hands and we wear the same size gloves, even though we're so different, our feet, right? (laughs) There's 80% of us share a lot of things, but then there's going to be that first maybe 10% that are lower um, outliers, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of that bell-shaped curve, there's the other 10% of outliers. If we want to think about this in terms of what you just, the question you posed, Mm -hmm. I think that about 80% of the people are going to kind of slowly adapt. 
People are talking about AI. Average people are starting to use it, integrate it into their work or their creative projects. They're coming along. A lot of people work on Zoom or they're accepting some new political um, movements or so social things um, to get along, to understand that more people are are not the average, whether it's our sexual identification, how we think about gender, how we express ourselves, or anything like that. People are slowly, 80% are slowly coming around to it. 10% are going to be in absolute resistance. They're going to cling to the old. And you live in England and I live in the U.S. and we know politically, we know the polarization. And we can imagine how this would apply to that. And we're not talking politics. We're simply talking how do people react. Mm -hmm. But there will always be 10% that lead the way, right? On the other side, on that, on that cutting edge. That is literally the avant-garde. And Aquarius, the sign of Aquarius is ruled by its modern ruler, Uranus, has always represented the avant-garde. Mm -hmm. So people who have some attunement to this, now, they could be Aquarius sun signs. That's pretty literal. They could be an Aquarius rising sign, meaning wherever, whatever, whenever their birthday is, whatever sign they have, it's, we're not talking about their sun sign. We're talking about the sign, the constellation that was coming up over the horizon at the time they were born. That could be Aquarius. Their moon could be an Aquarius. They could have a strong planet Uranus in their chart. It could be high in the sky. It could be touching their sun or their moon the most important personal planets. It could connect to a lot of other planets. These are the technical ways that we might see somebody with this kind of kind of association. For you, for example, if I can use you, you have yours very prominently right at the bottom of your chart. It's part of your grounding. It's the essence of who you are. I would even think that perhaps if we were looking at your chart in a, in a reading, I would ask you, did you have grandmas? Did you have people up in the line who had sensitivity, who knew things, who were healers, who were seers? Because this looks like it's part of your very lineage. Mm. You also have your moon. Now, your moon is not in Aquarius. It's in another air sign, Gemini. It's why you're such a beautiful communicator and have such a beautiful voice. But it's in the Aquarius house. So there's this, there's this like longing, there's this connection that even can go beyond your conscious mind where you're drawn to these things, modern ideas, groups of people, humanity, serving humanity. And then your North Node, which is um, one of those karmic points. There's two of them. There's the North Node and then exactly 180 degrees away. That's just the way they will always be opposite. That's talking about your soul's purpose. And it's in your house of service. So for you, being part of this avant-garde, being attuned to things before they fully have come in, sort of like, you know, they talk about the canary in the coal mine, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to be the one who goes in and checks it out and leads the way. And yeah, there are people like that. And I think we all have a sense of them, even if we have never looked at their chart and don't know astrology. We know that person is on the cutting edge. This is somebody who's grounded, caring, and isn't trying to manipulate me because we always want to keep a watchful eye because there's so much uncertainty in this in this age, right, where anybody can fake anything. Um, we we want to continue to be skeptical and, and check things, but we can kind of feel who really is offering um, a new vision of the world. And one thing, and this is a little technical, but I'm going to try to break it down. Right when COVID hit in 2020, and Pluto and Saturn were still in Capricorn, Capricorn's the sign that precedes Aquarius. And every sign has a reactive energy to the previous sign. Mm -hmm. If Aries is the first sign and it's all about me and doing things fast, um, Facebook's motto, you know, move fast and break things, that's such an Aries kind of motto. So what's the next sign, Taurus? Whoa, take your time. Um, a job worth doing is worth doing well. Let's be methodical. Let's be in our bodies. And the next sign, Gemini, is too much in the body. Let's be in ideas. Let's talk and communicate. Let's bring everybody in. And so Capricorn 
one of the last signs, is about structures and systems and institutions. And again, it's neutral. You can have a wonderful government. You could have a wonderful medical system. You could have a wonderful education system. But most of our modern countries, we haven't been paying attention and things started to break down. Whether it's how we teach, can we reach all children? Children who are neurodiverse, do we have the means of helping them? Medically, what about people who can't afford insurance? I mean, we just, we started to see all the cracks in the foundations. COVID made it very, very clear as resources were tested. And we started to see, wow, the old ways of doing things not only aren't working, they're not really kind to a lot of people. A lot of people slip through the cracks. And so as Pluto and Saturn were finishing up their time, um, there was a movement into, both of them were going to move into Aquarius. And they both moved into Aquarius in March of 23. Um, well, no, I shouldn't say that. Pluto... Pluto moved into Aquarius and Saturn actually moved into Aquarius um, in December of 2020, along with Jupiter. That was the beginning. Jupiter and Saturn moved in on the same day in December. It really was this new arrival. Um, and Pluto was finishing up its run in Capricorn. And so the two ruling planets of Aquarius are Saturn and Uranus. And they spent the next year and a half in the very, that first year and a half of full-on COVID, well, starting in about 21, they were making a challenging angle to each other in the sky, representing a lot of people feel that kind of death grip, those last gasps of these failing systems, and even of the patriarchy as the dominant uh, worldview, mm -hmm. and the system that really governs so many of our countries and our institutions. Aquarius is breaking free of that. Aquarius is about people. It's about true democracy, about people getting the vote. It's about people policing themselves and taking care of themselves and making decisions about their bodies, not letting someone else do it for them. This is when we saw Black Lives Matter. This is when we saw Me Too. And we saw, again, that that in the United States anyway, that big fight for reproductive rights that just last year was unwound. And so there's this battle that is waging. Some people are going to cling to the old ways because it's familiar, because it's safe, because change is scary, because they benefit from it. Mm. We always want to see who's benefiting from it. But there's a very strong movement toward Aquarius, and Pluto is going to dip back into Capricorn for two months from September to the middle, middle of November of this year of 2024. And I think in, in the U.S., <laughs> that's our election. election yeah. And it's going to, and that has consequences for the whole world. I don't think America is the center of the universe, but it does, it does reverberate for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it is important what we do and whether we uphold democracy or not. And that's that's being tested right now. That's the biggest test of all. And we're going to see what happens. But I do think that we can see in people's chart who have an affinity for this. But it's also what are they, what we know, not just from our nature, but from the field of epigenetics, which goes beyond the genes you've inherited to the environment that, that your genes are exposed to, right? You can be the healthiest person in the world and live next to a nuclear reactor, it could have a meltdown, you're going to get sick. You've done everything right. That's your genes. But the environment is toxic. But also toxic language, toxic relationships. It isn't just physical chemicals. This stuff is just as toxic. So what people are exposed to is going to either get their genes to switch on, right? or switch off. Mm -hmm. So that's that goes beyond the chart, right? It's what what the individual is exposed to and how she chooses to react to it when she has a choice. Mm -hmm. So we can see the potential, but I don't know if somebody is maybe radicalized and they're going to move, they're going to get more reactionary. Or somebody has, maybe somebody doesn't necessarily come from a background that's open-minded, but they they have a teacher 
or a best friend who's from a different culture or a different color, different religion, and they see they're no different from me. I'm going to stop buying into those old systems. So it's hard to predict how a chart will unfold. Mm -hmm. I would even go so far as to say it's impossible. But we we can see where the person's at. And um, I find that most people who come for readings are somewhat open-minded. I mean, they really wouldn't be coming for reading <laughs> if they were locked down and, you know, just yeah. trying to hang on to to what they've had or their people have, have taken for themselves. But I think that this is inevitable. And some people are going to come willingly and some are going to lead the charge and others might be drag kicking and screaming. But I think over the next 20 years when Pluto is in Aquarius and a lot of other planets are making major costume changes next year, I think we're going to see a very accelerated and very dramatic shift in the collective. And hopefully, you know, whenever there's whenever there's movement toward the positive, you know what happens, right? There's that pushback, mm -hmm. right? It's just kind of these bigger forces trying to keep things in balance. But I think if enough people take a strong enough stand for this and are resolute in this positive movement, progressive movement that really favors all people, not just privileged groups, I think it's going to accelerate this change. Mm, mm. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for that. I'm hoping for that, and also to, um, to stop to stop kind of defining each other by separation as well. Because I, I know, mm -hmm. you know, like at, at the moment, there's so much about um, highlighting the groups uh, that we all align with, and I can see how it seems beneficial, but I'm still of the idea that just by pointing out our differences is not necessarily always going to bring us together because then we align with the ways that we're different and it's finding ways that we're we are similar in spite of the things that are different about us you know that's that's where i think you know that's where i some of some of these movements i see i see the 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 good in it that i see the idea or the the idea of the directive, maybe or maybe not, who knows where these directives come from. But I just believe there's a different way that we can work on being together. And it's looking at how we're how we're how we're similar first, as opposed to how identifying with our differences. Because if we see the similarities and we see everyone as brothers and sisters and we help them from the heart, as opposed to how they might identify themselves externally or in any other way um that's how i feel that things will will kind of uh, kind of ease where where we're fighting at the moment because i just don't know how that can continue to continue it, it, to it can't continue in a good direction um it is important to know who we are and it is important to know who we belong with and, and who who our our soul tribes are that that's important but so many of the and, and the differences in each incarnation are real there's a reason that we're born into the culture into the family into the country um there's there's significance to that that's part it's like a character in a play or a movie the actor needs to know the character's backstory needs to know its motivation right that's how actors can inhabit a character well, that's all we're doing. We're inhabiting this ego lifetime. So we need to know the backstory. We need to know who our grandparents were. We need to know what, you know, whether we've always practiced a certain religion or whatever it is. That's that's part of the identity. But the whole movement toward a spiritual awakening is to realize that's just a role and that our souls are immortal. And everyone's soul is immortal. And that person that I think I don't like because of their religion or their background, their soul is immortal. And when we start to, again, pulling that camera back and seeing the bigger picture, we realize there is no they. There is no us. And if we truly believe that we're here to wake up and to be enlightened or saved or whatever language is comfortable for you, we, we understand that no one is saved. 
until everyone is saved and we stop the petty fighting and we get on with a much, much higher mission of trying to help everybody. And this is what I think part of this new age, Aquarian age, which we're not technically in from an astronomical perspective, but energetically, this is this is the bringing forth of the Aquarian ideals of humanitarianism, egalitarianism, fairness, equal rights for all people, equal pay for people doing the same work. And you probably have heard this, and this is just one of my all-time favorite quotes from the spiritual teacher Ram Das, who himself had a great, excuse me, Indian guru, and I used to do a lot of work with Ram Das back in the 1990s, early aughts, and he would say, we're all just walking each other home. Mm -hmm. And if we could remember that, I really think that could help us stop focusing on the differences and really seeing each other as just, hey, we're really literally in this together. How else could you, you can't say anything anything higher or better than that? What a beautiful <laughs> what a beautiful pause. I I love that so much. Um thank you for today. Thank you for your sharing. And um can you can you let everyone know where where um I, I i'm just in love with the conversation <laughs> thank you so much suzanne can you just let everyone know where they can find you and, and also if you have anything out that you'd like to just highlight at this moment as well please do i thank you for the opportunity to to share with you i just feel like we're just sitting around talking stories and it just feels so organic and i've just really appreciated this um the one last, like the PS I would say is, this is all very meaningful. And people say, my vote doesn't count. My opinion doesn't count. The, the small work I might contribute is meaningless. I would challenge that. I would say every, everything counts. Every, we, need, we need everybody's voice. Mm -hmm. I, I, an image I share with people sometimes with clients is, imagine you're in a choir and you have a sore throat, and you go, oh, I'm just going to lip sync. Well, what if everybody in the choir lip syncs? Mm -hmm. You don't have music. <laughs> We're meant to contribute our voice. And when we, when we don't feel comfortable with it, well, that's, that's like a light on the car's dashboard, right? There's something to look at there. And you get to do the work on it. But everything matters. And, and never more, I would say, more critically than now when so much hangs in the balance. So for people to really feel empowered and and really feel like they matter. Mm -hmm. And then the way to find me, um, the easiest way, um, and when people want to work with me, some people just will go right to my website, which is starsandstoneshealing.com, Stars and Stones Healing. And they can read more about me, and there's a way to book a reading directly. But if people just want to find out how to work together, should they do one reading? Should we do some astro coaching? This is so easy. They just go to ask Suzanne, my name, Suzanne.com, and there will be an opportunity to book a short free call, no obligation, no cost, just, just to get a better sense. I know when I'm going to do work with people, I want to just get a better sense of them. And I always appreciate when people are willing to do that with me and it only seems fair to offer it right back out there. Thank you so much for today. I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. And you have a beautiful day and thank everybody for, for being with us today. Thank you so much, Suzanne, for sharing your story with me and thank you for listening. Find out more about me on my website, carolmaywittick.com, C-A-R-O-L-M-A-E, w-h-i-t-t-i-c-k dot com i'm also inviting you to leave a review if you've enjoyed this episode and to share to any of your friends and sisters who you feel may benefit from the message of higher energetic resonance also connect with me on social media i'm kazmic c-a-z-m-i-c-k on instagram and carol may Wittick on linkedin and on facebook until the next episode take care thank you <laughs>